Well, hello and welcome to day number five of Harper McLeod's Marine Economy Week. By way of introduction, I am Ewan Stafford. I'm a senior associate in Harper McLeod's employment team. And in that role, I've supported a number of businesses across the sector in a range of matters from drafting contracts through to advising in day-to-day employment law matters such as discipline and sickness absence, all the way through to supporting clients in the marine economy with contentious issues such as employment tribunal. Today, I am joined by Martin Leyland, who is MD of Shetland Seafood Auctions, Angus Ferguson, who is founder of Onboard Maritime, and also my colleague Ashley Fleming, who specialises in immigration. We'll hear from the speakers in due course. Now, one of the things you might have noticed is that there's a chat function at the bottom of the the, the, the the presentation box you're looking at. By all means, if you have any queries, please drop your query into that box and we'll do our best to pick it up at the end. So today's theme is people and skills, but why is the maritime economy important to Scotland? Well, the simple fact is that the marine economy employs approximately 75,000 um, provides 75,000 jobs in Scotland, and that contributes approximately 2.8% of total Scottish employment. Within that, over 27% of Scotland's fishing workforce is non-UK, with over 19% being non-EEA uh, individuals. Approximately 10,000 maritime students are trained annually at the City of Glasgow College, and given the unique nature of our coastline, there's a, a maritime area of some 617,000 square kilometres of marine area, which is actually seven times greater than the actual size of the land within Scotland. Given the unique nature of the sector, it's not without its difficulties, and prime amongst those is attracting and retaining labour. There are many reasons for this, but the regions and locations where marine sector activity is concentrated are often remote and rural, with poor transport links and limited access to skills. That being the case, it's harder to attract people to work in remote areas where perhaps the infrastructure and access to services and amenities is somewhat limited. A further challenging factor is, is in terms of retaining staff within the sector, particularly when there's opportunity, particularly for those in higher skilled roles to move into other sectors where perhaps the, the, the terms um, of employment might be more favourable. One snapshot to be acutely aware of is seafood processing, where approximately 40% of all employees are non-UK, with the majority coming from the EU. This is most acute in the northeast of Scotland, where some 70% of those employed in fish processing are from the EU, and it's Clear, therefore, that immigration policy um, has an impact on the, the workforce, and that's something that Ashley will talk about at, at a later stage. Also, in recent times, um, the press has been full of stories in respect of what's been going on at, at P&O, and just this week, in terms of the Queen's speech, it was announced that there will be a Harbours Seafarers Remuneration Bill. Now, the purpose of this bill is to protect seafarers working aboard vessels visiting UK ports by ensuring that um, the ports will have powers to refuse access to services that, that do not pay an equivalent to the national minimum wage to their seafarers whilst within UK waters. Now, this is proposing to have a wide um, range of powers, and amongst other things, that might include surcharging ferry operators who do not pay minimum wage, requiring operators to have employment details of their crew, even if they do not employ them directly, and legal sanctions in cases of non-compliance. Now, at present, each vessel entering UK waters is subject to the rules, including the wage regulations of the flag of the state, and therefore this proposal is met with some opposition from various quarters. It's expected that consultation on this bill will open shortly. Now, having touched upon some of the issues within the sector, I'd like to pass over to Martin of um, Shetland Seafood Auctions. Martin, can you tell us a bit about yourself, 
Shetland seafood auctions and some of the issues that you've seen. Okay, um, thanks, you. I'll try and uh, share a screen just to give you a little bit of uh, background. Um, so um, <clears throat> our business is an electronic white fish auction um, in Shetland. And uh, for those that don't know the layout of Shetland, you can see uh, here that we've got a fish market in Lerwick on the east, and a fish market in Scalloway on the west. And that's to suit the fishing patterns so that those fishing on the west will be able to land on the west, et cetera. Um, now, let's move here. About us, we were, uh, when we were formed, it was to play a central role in making sure that there's a sustainable and prosperous future for the fisheries sector. And the, this slide shows you we were formed back in 1998 with a range of shareholders from the industry. Um, and the actual electronic auction started in 2003. What we're seeing here is the precarious nature of being on, on board a fishing boat. And I'm uh, probably the most modern boat in our fleet, the Ocean Challenge. Um, but the two pie charts um, indicate how things have changed. In 1980, most of the fish being landed was cod, haddock, and whiting. Whereas from uh, this chart and today, you can see a variety of species. So we're, we're suiting um, the marketplace a lot, a lot more. And we've had to adapt, uh, obviously, with that. Um, in Shetland, over 300 million pounds of seafood, seafood is exported annually. And in our case, the whitefish landing tend to be around about 40 million pounds. We've got 22 boats in the fleet, but we also see landings from various Scottish boats because it's convenient if they're fishing in and around Shetland to land here. Um, Peterhead's the largest market in the northeast of Scotland in the UK, uh, but Shetland is the second largest behind Peterhead. And prior to COVID, we were able to say there was more fish landed in Shetland than in the whole of England, Northern Ireland, Wales. Um, in our case, we've had business development since the auction started, and <clears throat> seen staff numbers um, triple, and our operational activities have expanded, but I'll go on to that um, a bit later. And the brand new fish markets opened in August 2020. Um, This is too small to read, but what we're saying in this uh, slide is that <clears throat> with these new fish markets, we should be able to um, further increase the progress we've made because in 2003, there was 120,000 boxes being landed. Uh, Pre-COVID, we'd gotten up to about 430,000 boxes. And I think with these two new fish markets, we've got capacity to grow to five to 600,000 boxes. We've also got a new um, electronic auction system called Cosmo. I'll speak about that a little bit. And um, I'm getting too long in the tooth, so we've got to do a bit of succession planning for the auction manager position. And our operations require a flexible, multi-skilled uh, team to deliver the services of unloading, sample weighing, weighing and grading, and labeling. Um, so the, these were the challenges we wanted. You can't stand still in any business. We had to remain competitive. Um, and by investing in this web-based system <clears throat> and having the two new fish markets, we think that we can um, continue to sell the top quality fish and attract a wide audience of fish buyers. The actual Dutch auction system we've got, we sell about 60 tonne of fresh fish, fresh white fish every day. Um, how the auction works is um, the buyers come in about six o'clock, they get a catalogue at seven, they contact all the companies that they're, they're buying on behalf of, and at eight o'clock the auction begins. Um, the Dutch auction is the fact that the price is set high, and it, as it drops at a penny a kilo, the first person to press buys that fish. So it's very competitive. 
Um, we have quite a range of remote buyers placing bids from uh, their own offices. Even in Shetland now, since COVID with the restrictions, our buyers have actually moved to their own offices to buy. But we've got remote buyers in the UK and abroad. This gives you a quick picture of the uh, setup here. Top picture is the actual new auction hall. And the bottom section shows you the screen that they're seeing every day. Uh, this is the clock here. Um, and finally, um, this is an up-to-date picture of one of our staff there using the electric pallet truck to unload the fish from the boat um, and go on to um, the different services now. So I go back to change the screen here. So just going through what actually happened, um, this is the roles and responsibilities. So in a 24 hour period, which we're involved in, and I have to stress that because one of the problems for uh, retention and recruitment is the fact that we're operating through a 24 hour period, particularly in night shift work. So once the boats caught the fish, they communicate with the fish agent who put the actual data onto our website, the landings page. That's done about 18 hours before the auction starts, so the buyers get advanced information. Um, once the fish have, have been landed, um, we, as you saw on that previous photograph, use electric pallet trucks um, to move the uh, boxes that have been taken out of the boats inside the market into um, set areas. We have a plan and numbered floor areas so that we know which, which boats are in which areas. And that's happening um, probably from mid-afternoon through to the early hours of the morning, so between 8 to 17 hours before the auction. Then we come on to probably our biggest task, which is where the boats ask us to weigh and grade fish. Some of the boats have scales, but they don't necessarily have time to do all the grading. So particularly with things like monkfish, which lose weight with drip loss, we'll be asked to do uh, the weighing and grading. So we are now using, and one of the things we've had to do to um, make sure that we can compete with other companies for staff is we've introduced technology and each of the scales now is fitted with a, a tablet, which has a direct link to the manager's computer. So when they put a box on board the scale, it's recorded onto the tablet, but it's also picked up by Wi-Fi and gone straight on to report on the managed computer. Um, and I think that the move from when this used to be done manually and everything was just uh, handwritten to using technology um, gets us into that semi-skilled and attracts more people. And we're able to, to pay a really good uh, rate per hour. But one of the problems we've been experiencing is that uh, since Brexit, um, the landing patterns have changed. You used to be able to uh, get fish to Glasgow on the overnight ferry, and you'd have a day one for day two, so that it'd be in Europe on, on, on day two from Glasgow. Now it's day one for day three, so we're seeing that the buyers have to guarantee the fish are going to be there. So Sunday for Monday is busy, Thurs uh, Wednesday for Thursday is busy, and Thursday for Friday is busy. But the Monday for Tuesday and Tuesday for Wednesday, not so busy. And what that means for us is that we have 10 to a dozen staff working on the busy nights and maybe only two to four staff on the quiet nights. And although you're paying well above the minimum wage rate per hour, you're not getting the volume of hours to satisfy all your staff. So we're continually having to uh, work on the way we remunerate and obviously uh, having moved to the new fish markets, the facilities provide much better um, changing rooms and stuff like that. So we've been working over the last five years and in moving into the new markets and uh, looking at the fishing patterns. 
and looking at the way that we remunerate. And we're starting to see now, even though Brexit has disturbed it, we're starting to see that we're getting to a settled uh, pattern with uh, the recruitment. Um, and we also do some sample way in which is um, a regulatory thing, but we have uh, taken it further and we provide information and it's all using uh, these tablets and uh, the technology to be able to produce reports that help the buyers have more information and pay a better price. And um, once the fish is sold, um, we actually have to put uh, the labels or the tickets uh, from the sale onto the boxes so that the buyer can identify which is his fish and they have their own staff that remove it. And then finally, when they're removed, the fish is transferred to the ferry. Um, so I think I've covered most of the, the way that we operate, Ewan, and um, some of the problems, but um, not sure how long I've taken, but if you want to ask any questions or, or move on to somebody else. Yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, I think in terms of staffing, Martin. I mean, what what is the single biggest biggest issue that that you see? Single biggest issue we've seen is probably um, not being able to pay them enough. Where you've got volume against casual hours. If we had a, a consistent level of landings every night, we would probably need a crew of about six to eight, and we could probably afford to move to salaries that approximate with the rest of the industry in Scotland. But we see some of these guys earning less uh, than really is a living salary nowadays. So re retention is, is uh, a, a big issue. Um, and we, we're just working on it the whole time. I think we're getting nearer and nearer um, to being able to get to that um, salary situation. And, and with people moving on, you said retention is the big issue. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it purely a matter of your remuneration or are there, there are other factors at play, Martin? Yeah, well, it, it actually is remuneration because they can get, um, we're in competition up here with a very large aquaculture industry. And, you know, they can leave here and go and work in a processing firm, uh, salmon or even on salmon farms. and get guaranteed hours. So the nature of the fishing industry is they're, they're only, whatever they're landing is what we deal with. So a, a great help would be to see um, what Brexit can actually deliver in terms of changes in the way that they do the quota management system. Because the more volume we have, the easier it will be to retain folks. Volume issue, and it, you've seen in the last couple of years in the news how restricted they've been on cod quota, and it's ludicrous because we know that there's um, enormous amount of cod out there. The boats tripping over it, but the scientific assessment of it has been done in a different part of the North Sea. So we're, we've been at odds with the EU quota management system, and we're still at odds until this next five years. Um, sees how it's going to play out. Um, we, we've got the facility, we've got huge markets now to be able to, as I say, attract 500, 100,000 bucks. We've got to be allowed to catch it. So it seems to me that, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges there, bearing in mind the sort of flexible nature and the lack of guarantee as to what, what might come in any given day. Yeah. With that in mind, um, I'd like to introduce Angus Ferguson, who is the founder um, of Onboard Maritime. Angus, does what Martin said resonate with you with you at all? Yeah, absolutely, Ewan. There's a, the, the, really there's a lot of crossovers here. There's a similar themes that Martin was talking about that really you can you can sort of take forward when you look at the sort of a maritime industry as a whole, and, and really and really my focus on the, the sort of maritime education and training. So. Really, uh, just a quick bit about my background there. So I'm, I'm a master mariner. Um, I spent 14 years at sea before coming ashore to work in education. And, and there I spent 10 plus years at City of Glasgow College in the Faculty of Nautical Studies, uh, where I was involved in this, running the courses and developing pathways for people to sort of come in and sort of start their careers at sea. So 
one of the projects we we sort of developed there was the modern apprenticeships, looking at uh, sort, of a, sort, of a, sort of training and attracting people uh, into the industry to work as able seafarers on board ships there, uh, which is very successful. So. In, in 2019, I then set up Onboard, onboard Maritime. And really what we do is uh, we design and develop education programs, digital education programs for maritime professional, uh, professionals. Um, there's now a team of six of us. And we work with blue chip companies. We work with training providers and individuals. So we get a really good sort of snapshot as to, as to really what's happening in the industry. Um, and, and really we try and de design solutions to help attract people, retain them, and enhance their knowledge. I think I think some of the challenges that uh, that, that that really you mentioned there are similar challenges in the maritime industry that that we've got a real challenge attracting people. Um, and really, this has been amplified by the current market forces that you see at work. And, and really, you see this across in, in lots of different industries. It, it really is a candidate-driven market now. Um, for us in maritime, um, we sort of try to attract people into sort of going to sea initially for for life on boards of ships. And this is this is difficult. We're in the STEM market there. We're in that pool, so we're competing against some big established players. Some of the difficulties we have are, is it really the lack of awareness of maritime sort of careers and maritime sort of skills. Really, what you said at the start there about the about this sort of the maritime industry and and really its impact on the economy, then they really that's 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 not getting filtered down into school level. Um, uh, a recent survey by the uh, union, the Nautilus Union, said that at school, at school careers, only four percent of the sort of the school, the, sort of the school children were sort of being told about the possibility of, of maritime careers. So we've got a real issue there. Um, the other issue has been undeniably the impact of COVID. Um, the traditional way that we recruit people into into the industry was having recruitment fairs based at colleges around the around the UK and sort of Scotland. Um, but that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's just starting up, but we've missed a couple of years here. And the other thing with, 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 uh, with retaining people, once we do attract them, um, it's difficult to, to really sort of sell the idea of sort of going away to sea now. Um, go to sea and see the world. Well, in a lot of cases, there's go to sea and you're going to see a lot of your cabin because due to COVID, uh, people are on board ships and they can't get off the ship. So that's, that, that's, a, that's a big, difficult uh, adjustment for them to make. Um, for us, the, the, the really the way that we see things going forward is because, as, as you said, a lot of the um, as a lot of this maritime industry is quite remote, uh, it's quite sort of disparate, it's sort of separated there. The challenge for traditional training, education, and retraining is we need to get a decent class size to make this commercially viable, um, and and really for a lot of the um, a lot of the sort of qualifications for which which are really useful for people working on wind farm boats, crew transfer vessels, commercial sort of passenger ships, which are, which are sort of small commercial passenger ships, then it's a real challenge to, to do that. Um, what we're developing is sort of digital pathways, if you like, that people can sort of, uh, sort of work in their place of work and sort of continue these pathways. Um, the idea that, that online learning is, is, is somehow inferior to or sort of low quality product to a classroom based is, it's just it's just sort of nonsense now. To be honest with you, it's the the, the way the way that uh, sort of courses are structured and designed. It means you can get just as good experience, sort of in, in your location there. Add to the economy, increase your skills, and hopefully retain your talent. Than having to ask people to to, to travel there. So, um, for us, I think that really we need to move away from the traditional way that we've done things in terms of recruitment and and where we get the sort of that that talent pool from. Um, and maybe look at sort of really, really sort of different areas, sort of untapped areas and, and, and resources that we have. With, with that in mind, I mean, what what do you think the next the next push should be for the sector to to try to draw attention to itself? Do you think there's a way for it to do that? Yep, yeah, I think uh, really we've got um, we've got a number of really good initiatives at the moment. So we had the whole um, the, the the Maritime UK has has got the drive Maritime 2050, which is focusing on the the sort of maritime economy and and building up that pool of talent, um, so sort of really showcasing the sort of skills that we have and, and sort of generating opportunities. Uh, supplemented by that, you've got some great work getting done by um, by lots of different colleges in, in sort of Scotland here. So you've got the City of Glasgow College, Scottish Maritime Academy in Peterhead, 
the sort of Shetland Maritime sort of a college there, and the um, Argyle College in sort of Oban there that, that do lots of really sort of good at connecting with the, the young people there and sort of creating pathways. It, it's, it really is about making people aware and sort of increasing sort of, a, sort of awareness of these of these different opportunities out there. And with with targeting younger people, do you think that you know they they have to have had experience of the marine economy of maritime in the past? Uh, is there any way to sort of maybe break down that that need for a connection? Absolutely, it's um, really the the maritime industry is still a male dominated industry. It's and um, really we need to we need to, to change that. Uh, sort of diversity. Look for sort of different sort of sort of, sort of, sort of talent coming coming into the industry there. Um, so, uh, with, with Ashley on the panel here, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of keen to hear his Ashley's views as well about really, um, yeah, just just really in terms of immigration. They, they really, uh, I um, I know from from my experience there that we, we didn't really explore that too too far. Is 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 that something we should be looking at? Hi, Ashley, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. Okay, so while Ashley is trying to um, deal with some technical gremlins, what we're going to what I shall talk about is um, immigration and and the opportunities that that might bring for the the sector. Um, it's important to remember just the the importance that immigration has played um, in terms of the amount of labour provided to the sector. And as I stated at the the, the start of this presentation, some twenty seven percent of Scotland's fishing workforce is non UK with over 19% being non-EEA. Um, in your experience, and this is a question for both Martin and, and Angus, mm. when with that mix of you know, British and non-British um, staffing, have you had, have you witnessed or seen any difficulties in, in, in the workplace as a result of that? I can maybe start. Um... I see that more on the fishing boat side of the agents um, work with um, recruitment agents to deal with the non-EAA or so it's called. <clears throat> we, we haven't really uh, experienced that on the land side. And, and so, uh, oh, so, sorry, actually. I think I'm working now, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, okay, if I just maybe pick up on where Angus was in terms of what he was saying about immigration, and I think um, I think he's right, I don't think it's an area that was necessarily explored that much by the industry, and I think it's probably because there wasn't the need to do it. Um, going back to you and some of your statistics that you shared at the beginning about um, the number of European nationals that are within the sector, um, COVID and Brexit has definitely had a massive impact on the number of workers from that pool of, of, of staff um, because people have gone home during COVID because you know they might have been furloughed or, or lost their work and they have to have stayed away and then we've reached the end of that Brexit transition period and so any new um, workers looking to come from Europe who haven't retained any residence rights pre-Brexit are now within the visa system and so they have to apply for a visa in order to be able to work in the UK and traditionally well I'd say probably for the last 10 years at least anyway in order to get one of these sponsored visas by, by an organisation the scale level was really quite high and so there was a lot of the sector that was outside those those skill levels that were permitted for visa sponsorship and it's only really with Brexit that we've seen the skill level come back down um, to your levels or A level level and above, which has brought a lot more rules back within the possibility of sponsorship. So I think there's probably there's been there's been a delay in um, organisations understanding the changes and being able to 
to see that that actually can provide a solution. It's not the be all and end all because you know there are roles that just can't be sponsored financially. It just might not be viable depending on the numbers, the costs of of, of the additional costs of sponsorship. So it's a tool, but um, I think what's really important is is that industry educates itself in terms of what the options are, what is available, and look at these options that would work for them because. Within the marine economy itself, there are quite a lot of rules that fall within visa sponsorship. So we talked about fish processing, which is one of the, one of the big um, areas that is facing shortages. We had um, the the farmery salmon sector; they they've joined call with the rest of the food um, and drink industry recently, just last month, calling for um, changes to the immigration system to allow it to be more flexible. Um, to, to adapt to these labour shortages that everyone's feeling at the minute. And I think we've seen some success with industry in lobbying government to try and have changes that are sector specific. So we had the temporary concessions that were made last year for HGV drivers, for, for pork butchers and poultry workers. And so there is scope for changes to be made. I think, I think the issue is perhaps the changes don't happen quite quick enough to react um, to the needs that are there in the job market. So, so with that, I mean, what if an employer were looking at recruiting from abroad, recruiting from Europe? What what sort of preparatory steps would they need to take, Ashley? Yeah. So, I think I think the first thing is to just understand your options. Um, I think what's a really helpful thing to do for an organisation is to sit down and audit their the positions, look at what roles they have coming through and identifying whether they are capable of being sponsored and some under, under one of the visa routes um, that we have. If they are, great. But the next thing is then to look at the salary because there are salary thresholds for these types of visas. So it might be out of the reach of the, the, the back to the organisation. They might not pay that, that level. And um, so I think we look at that as well. And then I think really it's just not looking at immigration in isolation. You know, think of it as part uh, much more holistically. And I think looking at integrating immigration into your recruitment strategy. Um, and so if you do that, I think you do that, I think probably best by having policies, HR policies in particular, that are immigration specific. Right. So um, I think by doing that, it just really allows organisations to set and manage expectations, both with the staff members that they're trying to um, trying to attract the organisation, but also to managers within the organisation who are responsible for recruiting. Because if they know in advance what, what the parameters are, who they can offer sponsorship to, what kind of salary ranges we're looking at, and also what benefits might come with the role, then I think that just makes the whole process a lot more efficient for everyone um, involved. So I think what I'm seeing a lot of at the moment is organisations having to react to the shortages. And so they're not being proactive, they're, they're being very reactive. So they're coming and saying, we're desperate, we need to fill these positions, what can we do? And that's fine, but there's a time scale that, that goes with um, entering into that kind of um, immigration sphere in terms of obtaining a license, advertising for the roles and going through the visa process. And you could be talking, you know, three months maybe for, from identifying that individual. And if you haven't already got those processes in place or you haven't got a license in place, then in the competitive market we've got just now, you really run the risk of, of, of losing candidates because, you know, you've said, OK, we'll onboard you, but actually we're going to have to wait three months. Um, and then they've got a job offer from, you know, from someone else and they can start, you know, next week or, you know, a couple of weeks time. What are they going to do? They're, you know, if they need a job, they're going to take the other offer. So I think if you have those kind of things in place, um, I think other things to think about is what you might, what makes you more attractive. So the visa costs are really quite expensive. Who's going to pay those? Um, if you're not going to pay them, what can you do to assess those individuals going through that process, you know, things like offering loans to employees that you can perhaps, they can then pay back through their employment 
rather than having this huge upfront cost. Um, and also looking at protecting the organisation as well. So the last thing you want is to invest lots in an individual. They come, they get their visa, and then six months, 12 months down the line, that you know, they've accepted another role. So then thinking about whether there are any clawback provisions you can put into contracts, just to sort of give you a bit of security as well that this is money well spent and that you will get a benefit um, both in the short and um, the long term, I think is really um, key. Um, once you've got a license and you've kind of gone down that, that route, I think then all of what you've learned along the way of who you need, what roles you need to fill, that needs to be reflected in your recruitment. You know, in terms of where you place your adverts, who you're targeting. If you've already tried and failed for months to recruit from the local jobs market, there's no point, you know, just doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a better result. Um, and if sponsorship is an option, make it clear in your advertisements, you know. So you know, the amount of times you can look at a job advert and it doesn't say anything about um, immigration. It might not even say you must have permission to work in the UK. And so if you don't answer those questions, there'll be people that just won't bother applying in the first place because they'll just think, you know, well, if it doesn't mention it, it mustn't be an offer. And if it is on offer, then say it, you know, for the right candidates, we're able to offer sponsorship. Um, and it might just help increase the numbers, increase the, you know, the quality of the candidates as well that you're getting through and overall, hopefully, help in some way, maybe not 100%, but it goes some length to um, filling those positions, um, both, you know, now and building it into to your future planning for the organisation. If you can say, well, we can we can we can source people from this from these other areas, from these other work fields, and we can be certain that X number will, will at least come from that from that area and, and those efforts. Thanks Ashley. You mentioned the time scales and, and what might be involved. Are there costs for employers in, in looking at a sponsorship license? There are costs. And so um, I think that is why, so going back to the salmon farming sector, their calls to have more flexibility in the um, immigration sector is, is to do with costs as well. So they want, they're, they're currently asking for certain jobs to be added to what is called the shortage occupation list. And the reason that's important is because it reduces the um, salary threshold. So instead of paying the, the full rate that is determined for that role, you can pay 80% of, of that salary. And the fees that go with the visa process are also reduced. So it has a, a financial benefit to be added. Um, if you're just going through the processing um, as normal, um, the license can be between just over £500 to just under £1,500 for the organisation. It depends on organisational size. Um, but it's valid for four years, right? So it is a one-off upfront cost, but you will get the benefit for that four-year period that it's valid. Um, then in terms of the actual visas themselves, you have skill surcharges, which are, they, they're probably the biggest cost to, to organisations. So it can be anywhere between just over £300 to £1,000 per year of the visa, uh, depending on the size of the organisation. Um, plus there's other small fees for the certificate of sponsorships, £200, um, and then the visa fees as well. So it's not cheap, um, but, I think you've got to look at it in the bigger context in terms of what impact not having those rules filled is having financially on the company and you've got to weigh that up to see whether that extra expense might actually, in, in the grand scheme of things, might make the operation more efficient and more um, profitable. Thanks, Ashley. That's been, that's been really interesting. Does anyone have any, any comments on what Ashley had to say there? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a injury. It's, in fact, just listening to that, it's, it really just makes it clear that that really, if you if you're looking at the to really to go into um, sort of tapping into that and sort of using that source, then really it really has to be done at a strategic level and uh, looking at your business and creating that value proposition for uh, for a candidate. Um, 
Yeah, so I, 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 so I couldn't help but thinking. I mean, for a small business, when you when you're trying to sort of pay the bills and keep everything going, is 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 it is it quite is it additional workload in terms of, of sort of sort of paperwork and and the, the, really the sort of form filling for the process? Yeah, I mean there is. So you know there is a lot of paperwork to get the license in the first place, and when you do it, you want to make sure that you have the right systems in place to manage it going forward because. Becoming a licensed sponsor puts a lot of um, duties um, and responsibilities on employers to monitor activity of any migrant workers they have, but also report that activity to the home office. So if someone didn't show up to work or was on unauthorised absence for a long period of time, they need to know what they have to do in terms of reporting that back to the home office because failure to do that really um, jeopardises the licence and if it jeopardises the licence it's not just that one staff member that you've not made the reports on it's everyone who's covered by that licence that his position is at risk but I think that is a case of at the start of the process putting in the effort then to make sure that when you're not only thinking about your strategy um, to use immigration as a tool but also you're implementing policies so that particularly your HR function, knows what those responsibilities are, that there's named people that are responsible for that, um, rather than it being something that's done on an ad hoc basis. Because when that happens, that's when, you know, errors uh, can happen, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ashley. I mean, I think that kind of nicely sums up, you know, what, what we've been discussing today and the fact that, you know, there are, there are difficulties in the sector in terms of recruitment and um, and, and making an employer sort of open and attractive to staff as a means of re retaining them. Um, one of the questions that came came up in the chat was how easy or difficult is it to integrate different working styles or processes into into operations? And this was a a, a question that came perhaps you know if there's international staff. I mean, one of the things that sort of that sort of I remember working on was um, working with a client who had a large um, Polish contingent, and steps were taken there to make sure that where policies and procedures, that is, employment policies and procedures and contracts were provided, that they were provided both in English and Polish, and that was you know of a particular importance um, in respect to health and safety notices and things and, and things like that. But that was that was to make sure that everyone knew what what was expected, and you know after you know a, a period of time as well, what also be, became clear was that where there's maybe different backgrounds, there's maybe opportunity for for some tension, but within that there's important work that employers can do in terms of not only education for their staff also having policies and procedures in place to make sure that, you know, it's clear that they will not accept um, and will not tolerate um, any harassment taking taking place on grounds of, of, of race or, or otherwise. Previously, Martin, you, you touched on saying it was something you hadn't seen onshore. Angus, I think you were going to give the, the offshore perspective. Yeah, and it's um, it's really really throughout my career um, to work um, working on ships and even even to working in in the sort of college days. It's it's a, it's a diverse of a working environment. I've, I've I've never I've never seen or never had it, uh, any issues, and uh, so I don't know whether it's the sort of mentality of the seafarer, if you like, when you go away that you that you're on in a situation where you're sort of spending several months with sort of twelve people or twenty people that you've never met before, <laughs> and uh, you're not getting you're not going to be getting off, so you need to get on with people that really just helps. But um, in fact, in fact, really, with the, 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 the diversity and and the sort of different cultures, it just it just adds sort of creativity, and it just sort of you sort of learn a lot more. And yeah, I can genuinely say I've never I've, ne I've never been in a situation where we've had any any sort of uh, any issues with that. It's just out of interest, like in terms of the transferability of, of skills, so qualifications that might have been obtained overseas, how do they how do they compare? And is there um, conversion courses or anything like that that you have to offer through your organisation? Yes, and in fact, in fact, really, this is a this 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 is a big issue at the moment. Really, that transferability to so really after you've done 
sort of 10 years at sea, for example, you're a master mariner, and then you want to make that transition to, to a shore-based career, then it, 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 it can be really difficult. It's, it can be difficult because a lot of the educational sort of, sort of structure and the qualification is based on the technical aspects of um, driving a ship and how a ship works and how it works commercially there. And, and really going ashore, then really, as you know, it's, it brings in a whole different skill set of that, that really is not contained in the current sort of qualification and education system there. It, I mean, there, there, there are bits of it, but it's just, um, um, it's, it's really just sort of light touch. So, so really, we, in fact, we've sort of been working with a sort of couple of companies there that, that looking at sort of designing a, a sort of digital program there that really they can sort of transition the, the sort of staff and ensure that they've got sort of preparation um, and the, sort of the skills required to actually make that step because, because they really needed that technical expertise is needed within sort of shipping companies and the technical side. Um, but yes, it's just ensuring that that, that that process and that onboarding process is, is, re is really essential as well that they can fit into the organisation and, and, and really add value from day one. Well, thanks for that, Angus. I'm, I'm conscious of what, what the time is and we do have opportunity to, to run to, to one o'clock. Um, I'm not seeing any further questions in the chat box, but I think um, where, where I'd like to take things is just to say thank you to our panellists attending. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, Angus. Of course, thank you, Ashley, for giving the insight that you have into some of the, some of the issues facing the sector. And last but not least, I'd like to say a thank you to all those who have attended today. Um, on day five of um, Marine Economy Week. So on behalf of Harper McLeod, I'd like to say thank you and hopefully we'll be seeing you next year. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Okay.